we're back with Prof G Markets. I feel like we could talk about AI for hours. I do want to shift us to economic policy, though. Um, specifically, this initiative you started called Invest America, which we love. Could you give us just a quick explainer on what Invest America is? And I'd love to hear a little bit about how you arrived at this idea and why you started it. Well, let me first say thanks to you guys, Scott in particular, for drawing so much attention to, I think, the key problem the country faces, right, which is a growing gap between haves and have-nots. It's a crisis of hopelessness among kids because they don't see a way to have it as good as their parents had it. Um, And when they feel that way, they start turning against the system. That's the greatest threat to this country. Capitalism and free markets and competition has is what has created all of this prosperity, right? It is the path forward, but it's also the thing that's at greatest risk um, because there are too many people who feel left out and left behind. So Invest America is a very simple idea that's now being forged into legislation to start every child in America with an investment account from birth. You get your social security number, you get an investment account seated with a thousand bucks in the S&P 500. You can't trade it but you can open it up, look at it on your phone. So rather than waiting until you're 25 years old at best to start to save from your first job, after you've already missed a third of your life, a third of the compounding, we get you into this magic game of compounding and learning about finances from the very start. And as Warren Buffett has said, those first 25 years changes everything, right? Start with that really small snowball, but what does he say? You need a really long hill. And almost every American misses the first 25 years of that hill. Um, and part of it is because we have a huge cold start problem. It's super hard to for a, for a family to open up a custodial account, even for sophisticated families to open up a custodial account. So the government ought to do it for you. You get your social security number, you get an investment account. Seed it with just a little bit. Doesn't even really matter how much they seed it with. And then get out of the way and let the private markets work their magic. So every kid can open up their phone when they get in the seventh grade. They see their individual account that they own with a small slice of Apple, of Berkshire Hathaway, of Eli Lilly, of Microsoft. Um, And the amazing thing is if you start with a thousand bucks and 750 bucks gets added a year. Now this is, maybe your folks give up their Starbucks every other day, right? Or the company they work for says, hey, we'll contribute to the account of your kids, or philanthropically, or birthdays, or bar mitzvahs. But if they do that, by the time you're in seventh grade, you're going to have $14,000 in that account. Now you have my attention. Now you have my attention. You want to talk about you know, financial literacy? Show me the incentives, right? That's the incentive. I'm in the game. At age 20, you're going to have you know, close to 50,000 bucks. At age 30, 150,000 bucks. And at 50 or 55, a million bucks if you don't touch it right? Because we capture those first 25 years. This feels like a total no-brainer to me. And I'm wondering if anyone disagrees. Have you gotten any pushback? What is the argument to not do this? Well, you know, everything in Washington's a long putt. Um, You know, you asked me a little bit like how I came up with this. You know, um, I know a little something about feeling left out. I mean, I'm here in Silicon Valley today which very much feels like at the center of the action. But I grew up in rural Indiana um, in the late 70s, early 80s. My dad, who's first generation college, lost his struggling parts, you know, auto parts manufacturer um, due to skyrocketing inflation and interest rates. Um, you know, the auto industry was under assault by the Japanese. Um, and, you know, I love this country and I look at what's happening today. I listen to Scott and your TED talk. You're absolutely right. We have this emerging crisis, you know, that threatens all of this. And my young kids ask me all the time, what are you going to do about it? Right. So what concerned me here is that it seemed that people were moving away from the answer rather than to the answer. Right. The answer here is more capitalism and free markets, not less. Right. It, the ane- that's the anecdote, the power of compounding. How do we harness the markets? But we have to get everybody into that game. In Silicon Valley, we talk all the time about product market fit, right? You know, really early, are the dogs eating the dog food, right? And, you know, if it's complicated to get people on board, then there's something probably wrong with the idea. This is the easiest idea I've ever talked to folks about from the far left to the far right. 
right? But I would say, you know, to the extent there's pushback on the far left, they may argue, well, why should rich kids get it? Or why should you invest in all the companies in the S&P 500? Um, why not just some of them? But I would say that's very remote pushback. On the right, there's a lot of skepticism about government. Why should the government yeah. even be involved in seeding something like this? But again, I would say what's what's brought them to the table is the idea of 3.7 million new individual investment accounts a year actually owned by the families, owned by the kids, not owned by the government. This isn't another big government entitlement program. There isn't a government account. The government simply acts as facilitator right, to set up the accounts when you open your Social Security account. So I would say this, at a moment in time where there's not a lot of bipartisan agreement on anything, um, we're highly encouraged and excited by the momentum that it has. Do you see this as a program? Let's talk about some round numbers. St st start with six or 7,000. Do you see adding to it every year with some sort of tax-free status or matching status or branding it such that companies have a obligation or incentive to put in. Do you see it that we're going to totally, I'll use the word infantilize people and say you can't touch it until you're 65, or do you want to do it till they're 30 and they can buy a house? Or is this something we're trying to set up such that, and this is the idea I like, eventually it replaces Social Security. Then in 30 years, we're going to say, all right, in 35 years, there is Social Security goes away. You get a million dollars at least on your 65th birthday, and then it's kind of up to you what you do with it from there. Tell me about how the complexion of your specific program, how it differs from some of the other programs, and what you see the end state goal. Who is Who gets this money when and for what purpose? Yeah, no, you have a lot of important questions embedded in there. So let me try to break them down one by one. First, I don't think you can start with $6,000 or $10,000 or $5,000. It costs too much money. There's not going to be political support for it. And you don't need to. Right. I think the difference between what uh, we're proposing or Invest America is shaping up is you get 90 percent of the bang of your buck by just getting every kid in the game with an individual account from birth. So actually, I would lower the seed amount to the lowest cost possible to make it tolerable for the government to pass the legislation. And a thousand bucks, three point seven million kids a year, to put it in perspective, three point seven billion. We're talking about a lot of increases to the child tax credit, right? As you know, the child tax credit, both sides support the child tax credit. Um, it's currently $2,000 to $3,600 per child, um, you know, uh, that's refundable back to the parents. The parents can spend that money on whatever they want to spend that money on. There's talk about, I think, out of the Harris team, raising that to 6000 I think out of the Trump team raising it or a version of it to 5000 Now. Remember, that applies to 74 million kids. So the cost of that is on the order of $150 billion a year. Very big expense. For $3.7 billion a year, we can give $1,000 to every child born. And over a period of 20 years, you have almost a, a, every American household that is touched by this. So I, I think part of the magic here is we're lowering the bar to adoption. Right. Because at three point seven billion dollars, you're talking about the cost of a single missile system that we're sending to Ukraine. Like this is a tiny rounding error uh, in, in, in our federal budget. So, number two, I think what we have demonstrated here is we brought together a group of companies that have all raised their hand from Uber and Dara Kashra Shahi to Michael Dell to Mark Benioff, who all say we love this. We love this idea. And we would contribute to the accounts of the kids of our employees, right? So understanding that we can harness the power of the mar private markets like a 401k from birth. So it's not only philanthropic co contributions, it's corporate contributions and it's family contributions to this account. We know in behavioral psychology, right? There's something called the wealth effect, savers save more. And it turns out that even folks who are part of poor cohorts or socially economically disadvantaged cohorts save more once they have an account. Um, so get them rolling, harness the power of all of these private sector participants, uh, you know, to contribute to those accounts. And then in terms of when they can take it out, Scott, again, the legislative process will ultimately determine where this comes out. 
Um, but one version that I like is that at age 18, you can take up to 20% out for a qualified expense, go to college, start a business, buy a home. At age 30, 30%. At age 40, 40%. And 50, it's all yours. Um, one key point that I want to make, this will die on the vine if people think that it's a Social Security replacement. It's not. We have to deal with Social Security as Social Security as a separate promise that we've made to investors. You and I both know that factually, right, there is probably a day of reckoning at some point in the future, right, in terms of getting that fully funded. There are a lot of potential ways to solve that, but we've made an important distinction. That has to be independently solved, right? But getting kids in the game from birth dramatically increases financial literacy, increases the probability they'll graduate from high school and college, increases the likelihood they'll own a home, increases the likelihood they'll start a business. And so all of those things are social goods that make this NPV positive, net present value positive in a huge way and stands on its own merit as a program and doesn't need to be the solution to everything, but certainly creates a lot of optionality as we look forward. We're sold. What's the status of this? Like, where where does it? If is, is this to a, a, a bill yet? Are there sponsors? If somebody wants to be supportive of this, how could they be supportive? Where, what's the state of play here? So check it out, Invest America twenty four on X or uh, Invest America twenty four dot org, um, where we where we provide a lot of updates. Um, we started 501c3. We've raised millions of dollars. We've started the CEO council, as I've outlined to you. There's legislative text. I don't want to say the names of the sponsors just yet, but you will be learning about those over the course of the next 60 to 90 days. But I would say the most prominent uh, Republicans and Democrat senators uh, and House members who are working through legislative language as we speak. Um, uh, we've been in touch with senior people on both presidential campaigns. And we think that when we get to the spring, here's our objective. Here's our goal, Scott. We want to have this all hammered out, the legislative language by this fall. We know whoever's elected, whether it's Trump or whether it's Harris, in the spring, they're going to have a package. You know, it's the honeymoon package that all, always comes out of the presidential, uh, the winning uh, presidential contender. And they're both talking about a lot of things for kids. Right. And the, 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 it seems to me that the uh, key component of both of their campaigns is a version of the child tax credit, um, earned income tax credit, uh, you know, uh, on, on the Republican side. It's fantastic. OK, but there's going to be a lot of wrestling. Right. Because we're going to have an evenly divided Congress. There's going to be a lot of wrestling over what we can afford to do. And what I'm hopeful of, if we have this on the shelf, ready to go right? If we're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to help kids, then shouldn't we have something that actually creates an account for the kid? The problem with the child tax credit, I love it, but the parents could spend it to buy a new iPhone, a new TV, a new car. They can spend it on whatever they want to spend it on, okay? Can we take a tiny fraction of the child tax credit, one one hundredth of what we're going to spend on the CTC, and put it into an account for every child in America? You know, in 2026, it's the 250th anniversary of this country, okay? What better gift to every future generation than a commitment that we start them all with seed capital in the upside of America, right? This is a bet on the future. The 500 best companies constantly rebalance the future of America. Sure, they can go up. Sure, they can go down, but you're betting on America. And we get everybody aligned, realigned around free markets and democratic capitalism in a way that they all win together. They should all be cheering, you know, in 2020 when the government comes in to support the markets. Instead of only having the 30% of people who are participating in the markets cheering, 100% of people need to be cheering. This is the way to do it. So first off, Brad, we're, we're rooting for you. We, we, you know, there's different complexions and nuance and colors around this. But we think it's a we think it's a fantastic idea, and we, we talk about this a lot. And whatever we can do to be supportive, we'd like to be supportive. Before we let you go here, I, I want to kind of switch gears. Uh, it sounds like we're a similar age. In I came a professional age in the valley, and I raised a lot of money for my own companies. And the thing that always struck me 
or the zeitgeist was, while investors such as yourself were very competitive with one another, there was this kind of clubhouse rules that they were very polite to each other and they would never be critical of each other in the press. It just, I mean, these guys hated each other behind closed doors, but it was definitely behind closed doors. And now I can think of few industries where the icons of those industries are saying such vile, aggressive things about each other. I'm just curious, as someone who, who left San Francisco in 2000, I'd, I'd like to get your take on why do you think it's happening? I mean, we've had polarized politics for a while, but what's going on here? Because I got to be honest, I'm sort of enjoying it from the cheap seats. I think it's bad for society. But to see a venture, one venture capitalist calling another venture capitalist saying he's got fentanyl blood on his hands because of the support of a newspaper that's writing an article about his fam. I have never seen anything like this in any other sector. What do you think is going on here? First, like you said, I think these things have been going on behind closed doors for decades. This country has had vitriolic debate for its entire 250-year history, right? I mean, called everybody everything under the sun. In fact, we had duels, right? We went and shot each other on the other side of the river. Uh, that was you know, pretty vitriolic, over the, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you know, over, over these misgivings. You know, the All In Pod last week where, you, you know, you, you well know I, I was the fifth bestie for a long time and, and spent a lot of time with those guys. You know, last week, Reed Hoffman came on for two hours, I think, and talked with David Sachs. And if you looked at what they had just been tweeting about each other the week before, you would have said those guys could never sit down and have a conversation. I thought it was an incredibly constructive conversation that they had. So for more downloads, we should have been shitposting you before you came <laughs> on? Is that what you're saying, bro? I mean, I mean, listen, you watch, you watch the NBA. They talk shit about each other on the court, and then they walk off the court, and then they're, you know, they're best of friends. So that doesn't cause me concern. I will say this. I, you know, and people accuse me all the time of being too optimistic. You know, I'm optimistic we're going to pass, we're going to pass Invest America. I'm optimistic that we're going to improve our system of capitalism. I think it's the best system the world has ever known. And I think our national advantage has never been greater. And I think a key source of our national advantage is our innovative advantage. And this is the heart of it. I think people, you know, are really heated at this moment in time because the people at the top of the tickets are really heated. Like it's a, it's a unique moment in our politics. Um, we're going to come out on the other side of this. Whoever gets elected, the country's going to survive and we're going to continue, you know, we're going to continue to thrive. Um, I would say there's as much partnering going on, you know, Scott, behind the scenes. All of us are having incredible conversations about ways we can partner. I've got a, I've got a closing question for you, Brad. Um, you mentioned you're the the fifth bestie on the All In Pod. You're a frequent guest. You're a good friend of them. I'm not sure if you know this, but one of Scott's biggest and loudest critics is the host of All In Podcast, Jason Calacanis. Oh, As a going friend here? of All In and now a great friend of the Profit Markets podcast, would you be willing? to broker a peace deal between Jason Calacanis, <laughs> a.k.a. J. Cal, and Prof. G. Professor Scott uh, Galloway. No interest. No interest. <laughs> Let me just cut this off. As FDR said, judge me by my enemies. <laughs> Please encourage him to keep shitposting me. I think it only helps I want to see it happen. We need the connective tissue. Well, um, I, I will say this, that um, I think what you guys are doing, what they're doing, um, what Gurley and I are doing with our own podcast you know, uh, the federation, right? The demonopolization of all these conversations in media generally is, again, part of the strength of, of the system. Lots of conversations, lots of ideas that are that are percolating up. And, you know, I'm sure he would welcome the debate. But I really appreciate you guys having me on. I'm going to take you up on your offer, uh, you know, to help push, uh, you know, continue to push on this. You, yeah, please do. We, we do love this, Brad. The, the work you do, Scott, is... Uh, you know, in highlighting the problem is amazing. Now it's time for a common sense, simple solution that both parties can get behind. I'm not interested in anything, right, that doesn't bring everybody to the table. I will tell you this. My son, Lincoln, just turned 16, went to Washington this summer to intern with Invest America. And I saw him after a couple of weeks. I said, what's your biggest takeaway? He said, you know, everybody tells me this place is broken. They hate each other. He said, everybody I talk to on uh, Democrats and Republicans, they're smart, they're hardworking, their teams are trying to come up with solutions to the idea 
This idea that America is broken, right, is way too cynical, way too pessimistic. And I think we're going to be surprised when we look back over the next five years. Our national advantage will increase, not decrease. Um, but we all have an obligation to do our part. Thank you so much, Brad. Brad Gersner is the founder and CEO of Altimeter, a leading technology investment firm based in Silicon Valley that manages public and VC investment portfolios. Brad has worked in technology for 25 years as a securities lawyer, a founding principal at the VC firm General Catalyst, and a three-time founder before starting Altimeter. Brad, this has been great. I really loved this. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, Brad. It's been fun, guys. Thank you for watching this version of Prop G Markets. Check out our pod feed for office hours on Wednesday. And we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Monday.